Okay, um, so we are going to uh, be talking today, um, as you know from our agenda, um, in terms of the topics we're covering each week, the Pratt Practice Fall 2020 agenda right here. Today, Saturday, October 3rd, we're talking about advanced algorithms and an introduction to data, and we'll talk more about data next week. Um, so we are going to uh, do a quick recap of beginning algorithms that we covered uh, actually two weeks ago, because last week was focused on programming. Uh, we're going to talk about algorithmic complexity and search and sort. And then in the second slide deck for today, uh, session four, October 3rd, we're going to talk about recursion and randomization. And then as mentioned, we'll uh, do an intro to the topic of data. Uh, so again, please find these slides at bit.ly slash mccu links, uh, go to the fall folder, and then to today's date. Parking lot is also right there, not in today's date, but in the fall folder itself, the parking lot. So please, if you have questions as we're going through it right there, um, please type your questions, right? You can see the previous questions we've answered, um, but we welcome more questions from you, both on the, during our class now on Saturday and throughout the week, um, any questions that you think will be beneficial for everybody to learn the answer to, please put it down. It's an individual question, I don't know whatever myself or the book does. Um, yeah. Okay, so once again, this is our test at a glance. We've been seeing this slide 20 times already, I'm sure. Um, but we just keep uh, putting it there to remind you about the number of questions and the percentages, right? So we're talking this week about algorithms and computational thinking, which is 25% of the exam, uh, second only to programming in terms of exam content. So a quick little recap from algorithms part one right here. Um, well, these, this comes straight from that ETS test guide uh, over here, where you have the outline of topics. So what we talked about two weeks ago in terms of algorithms, before diving into programming and pseudocode, we talked about abstraction. We talked about um, oops, abstraction. There we go. Uh, we talked about pattern recognition, problem decomposition, breaking things down into smaller pieces. We talked about understanding number based conversion between binary, decimal, and hexadecimal. And we talked about um, developing and analyzing algorithms expressed in multiple formats. We talked about natural language, flowcharts, and then of course we talked a lot about supercode, mostly in the context of programming, but understanding algorithms in that as well. So um, that was seeing uh, in the chat. Okay, uh, that's the link right there. Okay, so this is uh, what we talked about before. So now we're going to dive in into some more advanced algorithms. Okay, everybody ready? Everybody got their coffee? Everybody woken up, ready for advanced algorithms? Okay, so algorithm analysis. So this is what the uh, that outline from the ETS says, is you should be familiar with the limitations of computing in terms of time, space, space and solvability as well as using heuristic solutions uh, as sort of a shortcut to help address those limitations. So that's going to be our outline for today. We're going to talk about time complexity, space complexity, solvability, and unsolvable uh, computing problems, and heuristic solutions. Uh, some of these are we're just going to mention, but others are going to dive a little bit more into. So a brief overview uh, of analyzing algorithms. Uh, this is often an entire course in an undergraduate computer science degree called algorithms or possibly a sequence, algorithms part one and algorithms part two. So here's a link to one uh, free course uh, from Coursera in an algorithm specialization. And, um, and then and it can also be revisited as algorithms at the graduate level too. So this is the second one is a course I took uh, working on my uh, master's degree uh, as an introduction to graduate algorithms. So please um, just know that we're only going to cover um, about 25 or 30 minutes of algorithms today. It is only going to be a surface level um, because there are entire courses about this topic. 
Uh, but also know that the praxis will only expect a fairly basic or surface level understanding um, of algorithms and their analysis. For example, analyzing a situation um, or uh, a potential algorithm to solve some problem and determining whether it'll be logarithmic time, linear time, quadratic time, or exponential time. And we'll talk more about what those terms mean. Um, okay, so first of all, time and space, space complexity. And please, if there's questions in the chat, uh, Deborah or Diane, please interrupt me and let me know. Um, so algorithms can be analyzed based on the amount of time they take to run. That's what we mean by time complexity. And or they can be uh, analyzed based on how much memory or storage space that they use up by storing variables of different sizes. And um, that would be the space complexity piece. And then you can compare one algorithm to another algorithm. Maybe both of these algorithms solve the same problem. But one algorithm is more efficient because it runs more quickly than the other algorithm. Uh, or you could consider that's the time complexity. Or you could consider one algorithm more efficient because it uses less memory than the other algorithm that both solve the same problem. Um, more often, um, in, in, in my experience of uh, questions, looking at example questions from the praxis, looking at even just example questions in some of those courses, um, undergrad uh, or grad level courses, more often it's going to be the time complexity that is analyzed, uh, that were also called the algorithm running time more often than the space complexity. Um, so you should know about both and be aware of both. But if they ask you to analyze the complexity of an algorithm, it's more often going to be the time complexity one. OK. So just a note that those analyses are done in relative terms, um, not, not absolute terms. So we're not going to say this algorithm takes five seconds to run. And this one takes eight seconds to run, and therefore the five second one's more efficient. You, you could if it was if every single other variable was exactly the same. Uh, but the issue is that different computers have different processing speeds and other specifications like how much RAM they have and stuff like that. Um, so that that if it takes five seconds to run on my computer and eight seconds to run on your computer, that could just be because I have a faster computer. It might not have anything to do with the algorithm itself. Um, and therefore be um, not a good comparison. Um, so we, we do it in most relative terms. So Raja, you raised your hand. Yep. We Paula, can't hear you. Paula says that I'm echoing. Yeah, um, in my understanding, I thought algorithm is a draft that we write in English before we actually put, write an actual code and run on computer. So I thought we don't have to, that's a, that's like a, that's like a plan, initial plan that we write before we actually write a pseudo code or if we actually write a real computer program. Uh -huh. and not we would run an algorithm. So it can be used that way, but um, but an algorithm is it just by definition is the a plan to solve a problem. And so you can have two different plans that are translated into two different um, implementations of code, and one of them can run faster than the other. And again, the reason we're talking about it instead of program code analysis, we talk about it as algorithm analysis, is because the deep differences or the true differences in the running time is not in the implementation in the code. It's in the plan that we made. This plan is a better plan than this one because it goes a lot faster, right? No matter whether I code it in Python or Java or whether I run it on this super slow computer or this super fast computer, it will be faster than this other algorithm, which is a worse plan um, that running on the same computers and stuff like that. So, so that's why we're talking about it, uh, not with code, but with algorithms is because the plan itself is what is uh, considered good or bad. So we don't, we don't really run an algorithm. Um, no, I mean, you can't run an algorithm without translating it into code first. Well, yeah. But, um, 
but yeah, we, we, but we can analyze the algorithm. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Good question. Um, okay, so once again, it's done in relative terms, not absolute, because different computers take different amounts of time. Uh, additionally, almost every algorithm you can think of that, that's more complicated than, um, than something you, you would do, like, like um, brushing your teeth in the morning, right? Um, almost every interesting algorithm takes in some form of input. Think of it like in the pseudocode, we talked about procedures. And not every procedure had to have parameters, but most procedures would have an input parameter. Um, and so the time the algorithm takes to run and the space used up by the algorithm is likely to change or vary depending on that input. So for example, using concrete terms, not relative terms, it might take me 200 milliseconds to run uh, a sorting algorithm to sort through this list of a thousand people alphabetically, but I'm running the same sorting algorithm, the same plan, the same process on a list of a million people, well, that might take me over three minutes to run because the list is bigger and it has more work to do. So therefore, because of that, we often refer to algorithm analysis, not just in terms of the, the, the ab absolute times, but in terms of something relative to the size of the input n. Because the size of the input will definitely almost always influence the time the algorithm takes, we refer to things uh, based on that size of the input. So think about n as like the size of an array that we're gonna pass as an input to that procedure. Now a note, a, a very important note on this slide is that the praxis does not require you to know big O notation. It does not require you to be fluent in these terms here, big O of one, big O of log n. It does require you to understand these terms, constant time, logarithmic time, linear time, probably not linear rhythmic. I just threw that in there because that is one for some common algorithms, but quadratic time, cubic time, exponential time, factorial time. It does require you to understand these terms. It does not require you to understand big O notation. But for me, coming from a math background, I actually, this part over here makes more sense than the vocabulary terms right here. So I like to think of it in terms of this. If you don't like that, that's okay. Um, but just to talk about what does that mean for a second, the reason that what big O means is that the coefficients don't matter. So if I say an algorithm is big O of n running time, what that means is it has a linear running time. It could be like 2n or 3n or 5n or 7n plus 11, right? Any type of linear function, linear uh, mathematical function based on the input of size n will have a linear output of running time. 20,000 N plus 80 million is still linear in that variable of N. Coefficients don't matter. We're just looking at the basic behavior of the algorithm compared to its input size. Because for big inputs, 20,000 N plus 80 million is still gonna be a lot faster than n squared, quadratic running time. And for small inputs, that plus 80 million will really outweigh it. But for bigger inputs, bigger arrays, bigger lists that we need to sort through and do things, that quadratic running time will be slow. Okay. So that's been a lot of abstract talks. So let's actually dive in and do an example together. Okay, let's do an example together. So you can analyze an algorithm's runtime, talking about this time complexity, by counting commands and comparisons. So here is an algorithm that uh, is gonna be searching for something. It returns an int. And it is taking in two parameters. 
right? It returns an int right there and it takes in a number that we're looking for and it takes in an array. So of these two parameters, the array is the bigger one, right? The first is just a single int. So let's say our array has size n. What's happening inside this array? We have a for loop. We discussed for loops uh, uh, last time. Inside the for loop, we have an if statement. So let's try to count how many times will this for loop run? Well, the for loop will, will initialize i to zero. It will run up to the length of the numbers. That's what we called n. And it will run one uh, every time it'll increment i. So how many times will that for loop run? It will run n times. Okay. Um, what's happening inside the for loop? Well, we have one comparison inside that if statement. So we have one comparison inside the for loop. And if that happens to be true, we do one extra statement, we return that number. So how many comparisons need to happen? Well, actually there's another built-in comparison here inside the for loop, right? That one right there is the i less than nums.length. So there are two comparisons happening every time through the for loop. One to determine i uh, and keep going, we'll stop and then we at inside that array is indeed the number we're looking for. The current element inside the array is that the one we're looking for. So there are two operations happening every time through the for loop, and the for loop runs n times. So there are two n comparisons happening. Now there are also a couple other commands happening, right? If we wanted to count, uh, setting that i equal to zero. Um, setting i to i plus one. Well, that happens every time through the for loop, so that would need to bring that up to three. The i becoming zero only happens once. Returning i or returning negative one only happens once. So really, um, and this level of detail is not needed, but really I would say there are about three n uh, plus two different commands or comparisons happening. But what's important is, again, the, like I said before, the uh, lower level terms like plus two don't matter. The coefficient like three on the end doesn't matter. The fact that this is n and not n squared or n cubed or two to the nth power means that this is linear running time. Okay? This search algorithm will run in a time proportional to the input size of the array. Linear proportionality between the two. It'll just run in 10 seconds, no matter what the input is, whether it's an array of 100 or an array of a million. Constant time will be the fastest, right? Linear time is generally considered pretty fast, depending on the context of what you're doing. Quadratic time can be considered pretty slow. Other higher polynomial degrees, like cubic or quartic, would be considered really slow. Exponential is like supremely slow, like so slow, you never want to try to run an exponential time algorithm unless you really, really have to, right? Um, so that generally we're trying to figure out the speed of how fast this algorithm will run in comparison to other algorithms. And that speed changes based on computer, specific computer, and based on the size of the input. So that's why we express it in these terms, relative terms, rather than in, um, absolute terms like five seconds. Okay. Um, yes, so that little list right there is, is fastest and slowest. It does, it's not exhaustive, like, of course, end of the fourth power would be cortic to be in there. Um, but, but this are some common ones, right? Um, I put in bold, sort of the, maybe the more important ones you should know. Um, but but uh, all of these are some common ones that you might see when doing algorithms. So solvability, um, I don't have a whole lot to say on this. There's, there's some links you can read a little bit more about this, including uh, this Wikipedia resource right here about computational complexity theory uh, and the other Wikipedia resource up there uh, about um, the halting problem. 
So solvability deals with can a problem be solved by an algorithm, by a computational algorithm at all? Um, and that, that can be uh, dealing with, is it decidable? And in 1936, Alan Turing uh, figured out something called the halting problem and proved that it was impossible to decide or impossible to solve that problem. Um, that if you have an algorithm that is to determine whether another algorithm will ever halt or end, well, you can sort of create an artificial algorithm that will sort of feed back on itself in sort of a recursive weird loop that will never be able to determine whether it halts, right? So there are problems, and that was sort of an artificial one, but there are some actual problems in computer science that cannot be solved, uh, not even at the worst running time, right? It's just it cannot be solved computationally. Then the secondary question is, well, if you have one that can be solved, can it be solved efficiently? So that's where I was talking about, about some of the lower ones on that list, like exponential time. And factorial time is even worse than exponential time. Um, those are the least efficient right, running time algorithms. So in practice, if you have an algorithm that takes that time, that's not useful for much. Uh, I mean, you can solve maybe a really small input with it. But as soon as your inputs get large, and when we're talking about big data and the size of data sets for artificial intelligence, and the huge amount of data that need to be processed, those algorithms are not useful or efficient for much. And depending on the context, even like higher polynomial powers, like I uh, said, n cubed per cubic or n to the fourth. In some contexts, quadratic is even considered useful. Okay. Um, so thinking about things that can be solved efficiently, what we what we try to do is we look for more efficient tricks or shortcuts that can simplify our problem. Um, simplify our algorithm. Sometimes we can find little tricks that still solve the problem perfectly, in which case that's great. That's a better algorithm, a more efficient algorithm that solves our problem. But sometimes we sacrifice that perfection of solving our problem for a more efficient algorithm that will work most of the time. Maybe the algorithm is not 100% effective, does not 100% solve every instance of this problem, but it'll work most of the time or it will find a solution maybe not the ideal solution, like the very fastest time to go between these cities uh, and the traveling salesman problem who wants to travel and hit all these cities, um, but it'll find a good enough solution. And what that's called is called a heuristic. If you can find a good enough solution or an algorithm that works most of the time, that is called a heuristic solution. And an example would be like Google Maps, finding the best route, the shortest time route between one place and another place well, if you think about how many different possibilities there are to go, whether I turn on this block or I turn on this block, right? As long as the locations are far enough apart, it can be impossible for a computer, even the fastest computer, to sort through all those different routes in mapping that best route and find the truly best, 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 best route. But Google Maps knows that, well, if we can find one that's good enough, as in a very short route, maybe not the shortest possible, but we don't care about saving those last five seconds or 10 seconds off our route. We just care about a good enough one that will get us where we need to go in a short enough. So that is what is what a heuristic is all about, is, is that sort of thing. Okay, so with that, um, we are going to ask you in breakout rooms to go through example number seven right here, which comes from the ETS test guide. And then I, I based on number seven, I put together two more questions, number eight and number nine, with the same multiple choice answers right here. Uh, just to think through a couple other problems. They only gave one sample question that relates to time complexity, just to give you a little more practice with a few more. So we're gonna take about five minutes in breakout rooms to discuss those questions, and then we'll come back and discuss them all together. I thought it was factorial because of the statement, an algorithm that generates all possible orderings of the cities. And let's just say you had seven cities when you're starting you'd have seven potential cities could be your starting point. And then you've got to visit, and then you've got six potential cities that are your next starting point. And then you've got five potential cities that are your next. So that's why I, I think it's factorial. Yep, uh, that is a great explanation. Yep. So you can start at any of the cities, but once you pick your starting point, you have one less than that number of cities to go to next. And if you're considering all those options, um, that is, what is defined as as factorial in
So that would be big O of n factorial, not that you need to know big O, you just need to know the term factorial. And as I mentioned, that is even worse than exponential time. So that is a terrible algorithm. Um, I mean, maybe it's the best we can do in that actual situation. But in terms of being realistic, if we want to go to a lot of cities, that's going to be impossible to do. And that would be a great example where you might want to look for a heuristic algorithm instead of using that algorithm. Uh, but I'll, yeah, I'll it take is. it, Nick. Um, I said linear because you're just comparing. You're looking for one element in the array. So you're only comparing one against the next and setting that aside, one against the next, one against the next. Yeah, um, not necessarily against against the next, but against the best value we've saved so far, yeah. right? We'll set, set a variable to the best so far of the maximum or maximum so far, and then compare each element one at a time to that, replace it if it is better, or leave the best so far if that one is better. But you're only doing one comparison for every element of the array, so that is indeed linear, yes. Thank you, Paul. Okay, how about number nine? Nine might have been a little trickier than eight. Any thoughts on that? Can I try that one? Sure. Um, in comparison to number seven, the difference is that um, the, the first item will have to handshake with all the other items, but the next item doesn't have to handshake with the first item again. So it's not factorial. And um, it seemed like uh, it wasn't linear because there were all those things happening multiple times. So oh, we thought that it would be n squared, which I thought was exponential, but then I was mixed up. It, it turns out that would be quadratic, yeah. Yeah, exponential would be if the n were in the exponent, like two to the nth power or three right. to the nth power. Um, generally quadratic, cubic, quartic, all of those things are grouped together. They're called polynomial time. If n is the base and you have a number in the exponent. But yes, yes, indeed, that will be quadratic. And you can do that by process of elimination. Like, you know, it's not factorial. Linear and logarithmic are both really fast. So you think this would be a little slower. So you could do a process of elimination, quadratic. Uh, yeah. You might also recognize this as being, like I, I put down here an example, just like Rachel did on the previous slide. Let's say we have six computers. Well, the first one would need to handshake with five other computers, and then the one after that has already handshaked with the first, so we need four more computers. And like you said, Mike, it's not multiplying those numbers, which would be factorial, it's adding those numbers. And five plus four plus three plus two plus one, that's 15. But more generally, you might recognize these as the triangular numbers and know that that formula for triangular numbers is n times n minus one over two. Or you might not recognize that, right? Uh, but, but if you did, notice again, constants and terms like that don't really matter. What matters is n times n or n squared quadratic. But Nick, uh, can you go deeper and explain how easily we can go into factorial? Because if you don't read the whole question, I assume, yeah. Like, yeah, because I looked at it too quickly and I was like, factorial? Because yep. I didn't even read the whole thing. Yeah, so. the fact that you're, you're, even if you're thinking of the example and thinking of six and there's a five and then a four and a three, well, you uh -huh. might think, let's multiply them together and get factorial. But, but, um, but if you recognize read the whole question, <laughs> adding them up and read the whole question and assume this part here about, well, each information exchange being constant time means I might have to multiply that times a constant. But again, I don't care about any constants in my actual analysis. Okay, um, so Deborah, you're gonna take it next with search and sort algorithms, I believe, or start us off with that. And we'll kind of revisit a little bit of this as we talk about the search and sort. All right, so uh, shake it a little bit, and now we're going to start searching stuff. Uh, and Nick, you're going to get out of the presenter mode because I have a screen hiding something on the side. So, what, uh, what you're asked by the ETS is that uh, understand searching and sorting algorithms, and then can you analyze sorting algorithms like uh, we did with the other um, algorithms that Nick just did, 
And then can you tell the correctness and then analyze such an algorithm for correctness and efficiency? So these are the ones that are outlined. Linear search, binary search, selection search, and insertion search. Those are the ones that you're supposed to know for the exam. And over here on this side, we have it covered. There are others that you will see. So Nick, Nick if you could just click it and move. It's not moving. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you will see other, other things in some of the study material that you will look at, like bubble search and match sort, uh, match sort. I mean bubble sort, match sort, quick sort. Uh, but those you are not required to know for this exam. So yes, as a computer science teacher, you should know these ones because they're in your students' material, but they are not part of the exam. Only the ones that have an asterisk are the ones we're going to use. All right, so let's start with the search and sort over here. So why search? Why do we do a search? And actually people said sometimes that the most important use of a computer is to help you do some of the searches. You want to know if something is there and if so, retrieve it. We, that's what we do all the time. Even on our phone, when we want to call somebody, we are actually performing a search. And then when we find it, we click on the one that we need. So Google search, finding relevant web pages, look through a list of names to see if a student is already enrolled. And if not, add them to the list and you're going to do a search so that you avoid duplicating the information. So usually we are going to always perform a search before we do an add to that. So next, uh, next slide. All right, so we have two main basic type of searches, the linear search, also known in other areas as a sequential search. Uh, works on data, are sorted or unsorted. That is a very good a point to know. That could appear in your test in one way or, or another. A linear works on sorted or unsorted data. Check each item in turn and if found, uh, the goal stops, otherwise keep checking. So you're going to go through. If you find it, you stop, otherwise you'll continue. And if you reach the end of the list without finding it, then you're going to report not found. Okay, the next kind of search that we have is the binary search. Data must be pre-sorted and then you eliminate, uh, you eliminate half of the data each time by comparing a goal to the middle element. So if you're starting, and I will show you with an example, if you're looking for something, you're going to look. If let's say I'm looking for a letter, I start from A to G maybe, and I wanna look for maybe C. I'm starting very easy. What I would look is I would say anything from B onward is not relevant. Then from A to D is where I could find my C. So you're always going to be throwing away the other half. So unlike the linear where you're going through with this one, you think of where you're going to find, where you're possibly going to find your element, and then you eliminate one half and go to the other half. So it makes it faster. And we will play with an example in our next uh, slide. So here is a linear search. So if I want to find 16 in my linear search, I will have to go through one, uh, I, uh, and that, that's my number. That's my number at the beginning. I have uh, nine, I'm starting there, nine, 14, 37, 28, and all that stuff. And I am trying to find my number, let's say, which number do I want to find? Uh, 14, let's, okay, 20, okay, it was 20. I want to try to find 20 in this, in this, uh, in this, array or list, array or list. So what I'm going to do is we, the numbers are not sorted. So I don't know where to find it. So guess what? I will step through each. I'll go through nine, five, uh, four, 13, 37, 28, 95, 26, 54, 86, 91, 20. Bingo, I found it. 
and then uh, and sometimes you you can even go further because sometimes you could even have two of the uh, two of the kind of the things that you're doing. So we did do eleven checks to find that one. Uh, but if we were going to find maybe thirty two, we would go the number the one number in red will go seventeen times. While in binary, if we were going to find um, let's say our number twenty. What we would do, it, uh, uh, our list must be sorted. So as you can see here, the numbers are now sorted, they're in order. So what we are going to do is first we are going to go to the middle. We go to the middle and look at that, that is 32. So we know anything from 32 and onwards, we do not need. We are going to discard that side. And now we are going to go to from now uh, 4 to 28 and take another middle. And now we are right there. Our middle this time is 17. And now we look and say, okay, 20 is going to be on, uh, on, the, on the left, on the right side. I don't know which side. On the other side of, the, of 17, and we eliminate the smaller numbers. And now we do another middle in the numbers that we have. And we look, is, where is 20? We are going to eliminate uh, 28 and 32. And then when we do another middle, <laughs> a little slow. Okay, there, voila, we, we found it. So how many times did we do that? We did one, two, three. We did three different searches for us to be able to find it. And we found it at the fourth pass to uh, searching our numbers compared to 11 on the previous one. So this is the difference between a linear search and a binary search. Uh, it's faster and you are always eliminating the side that you do not want. All right, next slide. So uh, pick a number from uh, uh, from between one and 100, how many yeses, uh, yes, no questions will it take to guess your number? So this is an activity I like to do with my students and I like to bring in like a $50 bill and I say, I bet I can guess your number with less than, with 10 questions or less. Um, but if, as long as you answer truthfully, as long as you answer your yes or no questions truthfully, uh, I bet I can guess your number with 10 questions or less. And if, if I can't guess it, you get this $50 or something like that. And so, um, so it, of course, it would depend on what is my method for searching for that number. If it was linear search, any guesses about on average, of course, it depends on what number they pick. But if I was going to do a linear search, that means I would need to go through every number one at a time. Is your number one? Is your number two? Is your number three? Right? On average, how many guesses would it take me to get that correct with a linear search? Fifty. Yep, yep. So again, I, I could get lucky. Maybe they picked the number one, and I got it right on the first try. I could get really unlucky. Maybe they picked a hundred, and I'd get have to ask a hundred guesses. But yes, on average, it would take around fifty uh, guesses on average. Now, how about for binary search? Any intuition or thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I already gave you a clue because of my bet, but um, <laughs> any thoughts? How many guesses if I did? Well, what would a binary search even look like, right? Um, well, to be able to split the numbers in half, I need to sort of ask, I'm not just going to ask, is your number 17, right? I would need to split it in half and say, is your number greater than 50 on the first guess? And if they answer yes, I can throw away the numbers one through 50. If they answer no, I can throw away the numbers um, 51 through 100, right? But either way, I can discard half of the numbers at any given time. So the first guess, I can get, a, get cut it down from 100 possibilities down to 50 with my first guess. So let's actually analyze that. So the first, with, with no guesses, no, no questions, let me count the number of questions right here. With no questions, I have 100 possibilities. After one question, I've cut it down to 50 if I ask a good question. After two questions, I'll cut that 50 down to what? 
25. 25. Obviously, this is not a power of two, so I'll have to do some rounding or something in the next next one. But after three guesses, I'll cut it down to what? 13. 13. Yeah, 12.5, 13, so we'll round that up to 13. Uh, just give a little benefit of the doubt. After four guesses, what's half of 13? Six. Six. Yeah, seven. Let's let's round up just 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 in case that number is the one that we're landing on or something. So I'll keep it going over here after five guesses. Cut seven in half. What's that? Three or four. Call it four. Four, right? Um, after six guesses, let's cut four in half. Two. 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 And after seven guesses, I will be down to the number. I'll know what their number is. So really, when I was saying to them, I can do it in ten or less. I was giving myself a little bit of wiggle room in case I made a mistake or something. Uh, really, I could get their number in just seven yes or no questions if I do it perfectly, if I do it correctly. And if you think about, well, that has to do with powers of two in the binary, right? Two to the seventh power is equal to 128. So I could even say, pick a number between one and 128 and get it right in seven guesses. Now, if it was 129, I would need eight guesses to get that right. Um, just because that one extra one would throw me off, okay? So yeah, that has to do with log base two. Log base two of 100 is six point something, 6.7 or something. And I would round up and say seven guesses. Okay, take it back. Um, Deborah. Thank you, Nick. That was a good example. I'm sure your students love that. So searching comparison <laughs> run times, here is just for you to check um, uh, to check what we just ran, uh, what we just learned, that linear search is an, an ON uh, or linear runtime, while a uh, binary search is O log N, and that has a uh, uh, logarithmic or whatever runtime. So that is just something that you need to know. We do know that it's faster than linear. If you remember the chart that uh, Nick showed you from linear all the, all the way to quadratic, which one is faster, logarithm was faster. So that's all you need to know here is that one is faster than the other and why you choose it because you could get a question. Why would you choose this one and for what reason? Okay, so now we are going to talk about something we just finished. Uh, linear search and you will see why we need to do a search before we can do a search. What did I say? People are laughing. <laughs> okay, searching overview. Why sort? Uh, sometimes it, it's useful to have something in a particular order. So that's why you would need to, um, to do the search for them. And so alphabetical uh, list of names for attendance. Putting numbers in order to find the median. Maybe you want to take advantage of binary search, uh, there isn't faster runtime, uh, then being stuck with the slow for linear search. So you don't, uh, you don't do a pre-processing one time only. Search on the data before doing thousands of searches. So that's why we do, uh, we do a sort, so you don't have to repeat something over and over again. Okay, so when they, this, we have an example of, uh, of why you're supposed to understand this. So let's first read what ETS says. ETS says you need to understand searching and sorting algorithms, and you can anal analyze a sorting algorithm that's going step by step by step and saying whether what it's doing is the correct, uh, it's the correct algorithm or can you tell uh, its efficiency or its correctness? So they want to be able to step, step by step to understand that. They also want to be able to trace algorithms and predict output and intermediate results. Again, you may have something linear and binary and see what is happening and what you can do about and what can be produced. And then the last one, you need to be able to calculate the number of comparison, just like we went through and uh, Nick showed you that, uh, that example that he, he just showed. Uh, calculate comparison required for linear and binary search algorithms. 
that's the one where we took those sticks and we put them in between. And, and so you are able to see that one. And this is a video that uh, we'll watch very little of it, Nick. So this is doing a bubble sort right now, um, but this is just an example of what sorting is more general, right? And bubble mm -hmm. sort takes, mm -hmm. starts from all the way from beginning to end and all that. This will be a good example for you to go through and it shows you how to step through the algorithm and read what is happening and see what the output is. So this is the kind of information you're required to know how to go and step through your algorithm during the test and what is the solution that is being uh, found at, at the end. With a bubble sort, we could be here until next year. So we're not gonna do this for that long. So let's move next. Thank you. Yeah, so this is going to be a good exercise for those of you who need more practice to step through and if for, just for fun. So sorting several outcomes. We already saw, saw that the slower algorithms uh, is the quadratic two to the end simpler. Uh, and those are the, your selection, your insertion, and your bubble that we're not going even to talk about it. And by the way, bubble can be very fast if you do not have a lot of items in the line. So sometimes you just can say, oh, this one is so much faster. But usually they say uh, the worst case scenario. In the worst case scenario, what is it gonna do? Okay. Then faster alg uh, algorithm are the your linear, your, your linear stick uh, ones, which is your- Linear uh, rhythmic. Uh, which means why did linear, you write- Linear N times <laughs> logarithmic, log N. Why did you put the linear? Okay, that's fine. Okay, so for practice, you don't need to know all of these names uh, by name, but you should be able to trace the code and predict the intermediate result. All insert a missing statement into the code. That is very popular. They leave out something and then they're telling you, please put what would go here so that, they are, uh, so that your algorithm is going to run properly. That's a popular question that you could be asked. All right, this is another example. Uh, can you describe comparison based on sorting? Here, you, this video has several of them. You don't need to know all of them. We will again look at just one pass through. So if you are in classroom, you could do this with your students, but you're not. So we're just gonna look at it very quickly. So as you can see in the insertion, what he's doing, comparing them and then putting things in the right order, right, uh, right where they belong. So he goes, look at the number two, where does two go? Go all the way back and put it in the right place. So there's back and forth and back and forth and back and forth of what is happening. And that's why it's a slow one. To look sort of in depth at one of them, um, in terms of what the pseudocode would look like. Um, so we could have done this for insertion sort, um, or, but selection sort is one of the others that you are uh, expected to be familiar with. Again, not necessarily by name, like they're not gonna say, do a selection sort on this data, but they might present you with this pseudocode right here, or something very similar to it, and ask you to trace it through, or ask you what's it gonna look like after five iterations of this for loop, right? Um, or they might ask you, um, like, cover over one of these lines and ask you what is the missing code that goes here. So just to help us understand it, um, selection sort is a, a method that takes in an integer array. Um, and there is there are double for loops. There's an outer for loop and there's an inner for loop, which is where that n squared running time comes from. The outer for loop is n times the inner for loop is, well, up to n, this is gonna be more like the, actually the triangular numbers, but that's still n squared um, uh, if you eliminate the constants. Uh, so n squared running time for selection sort. Uh, basically the outer for loop just um, finds the smallest number so far um, and just the index of that smallest number. It keeps track of those two variables. 
uh, in the smallest number of the unsorted section of the array, to clarify, right? And what's going to happen is it's going to look through the whole array and find that smallest number. And then it's going to put that number in place at the smallest position. And it'll sort of keep a dividing line going so that there's always sort of one section of the array is sorted up to this point. And then it'll look for the smallest number in the next section of the array. And then take that smallest number and move it to the beginning of that. So inside that inner for loop, we have an if statement if the number we're looking at right now is less than the smallest so far, then what we do is the smallest, we, we, we change that um, smallest so far variable in the smallest index. And after the inner for loop, the inner for loop is what's actually finding the smallest number so far from that unsorted section. What we do is we swap the smallest number at index, um, smallest index, with the lowest number of the unsorted section, which is I. And of course, there is this helper method called swap, which is defined right here. Um, and that, that one's just important to know about how to swap two variables of any sort. You need a third variable attempt to sort of keep track of things as you go. So I just wanted to take a minute and look through an example of what that pseudocode would look like. Um, and then you are going to analyze that in a second. Um, and uh, in this sample, so we have one sample question here. We figure it'll take you a few minutes to look through it, um, where you're going to be uh, looking for six iterations of this while loop, right? So can we, uh, let's go ahead and do breakout rooms and look at that for five minutes, and then we'll come back. This is some sort of sort. doesn't tell you what type of sort it is. There is a while loop. There is um, if, and else, fill. and if in here. And then there's a nest of if, else, and if inside there. So let, let's start to work through this, right? So 21534 is our array. And our while loop says uh, while pause position is less than len, which is the length of our array. So our array is of len five. And our pause, let's keep track of pause, starts at zero. Okay, while zero is less than five, so we do go into the while loop. Remember, while loop doesn't even have to run once. It could run multiple times or it could run zero times. But it will run because pause is less than five. If pause is equal to zero, pause gets pause plus one. If pause is equal to zero, so we'll add one to it. And that finishes this if, else, else if. We've run this one iteration, so let's keep track of our iterations as well. We've completed one iteration of our loop by changing pause from zero to one. And that finishes our while loop, and we come back to the while condition again, while pause is less than len. Is pause still less than len? One is less than five, yes. So I enter the while loop again. And I see this if statement, if pause is equal to zero, well, it's not zero anymore, it's one. So we go into the else. Inside the else, we have a nested if else if, or if else, um, if array at pause. So let's keep track of our indices for this array. Zero, one, two, three, four. So if array at that position, that position one, what's in our array at position one? That's this one. Okay, if array at position pause is greater than array at position pause minus one, if one is greater than two, well, no, it's not. One is not greater than two. So we go down here to the else. We swap the array at between position and position one. So we swap. Now it's going to be one, two. We swap those two numbers. Everything else stays the same. And pause decrements down to zero. Okay, so that's our second time through the while. So we will cross off that one, that's our second iteration. Our third iteration through the while loop, we check the condition again, is pause less than len, zero is less than five, yes. So we do this if, if pause is equal to zero, pause gets pause plus one, so we do that, and that is the third time through the while. 
fourth time through the while loop, um, we look at this one and see is one less than the length five? Yes. So if pause is equal to zero, no, it's not. So we go to the else. If array at position pause is greater than array at position pause minus one. Array at position pause is that two now at position one is greater than the one before it. Yes, it is this time. So what happens? Pause gets pause plus one. So pause becomes two. And that's our fourth time through the while loop. Okay. Uh, so then starting the fifth time through the while loop, two, our position is less than the length five. So we enter it a fifth time. Um, if pause is equal to zero, no, it's not. So we go to the else. If array at position pause is greater than array at position pause minus one. So now our pause is two. So array at two is five. Array at position minus one is two. So if five is greater than two, which it is, pause just gets added one to. Okay. And we've just completed our fifth time through the while loop. So we got one more time to do, right? Because it said to do six iterations. So now pause is three. And now um, three is still less than five. Pause is not zero, so we go into the else. If array at position three, that's this three, is greater than array at position pause minus one, that's the five. Well, no, it's not. Three is not greater than five, so we're in this else again. We swap the arrays of those two positions, the two positions. So it's going to be three and five get swapped. We bring everything else down. And we decrement pause minus one back to two. We check the next back to one. And that is our sixth time through the loop. So we can stop right there and say, which of these answers does that match? And that matches B. Okay. So I would say that is probably the hardest question you have seen through these past four Saturdays um, in terms of level of detail and keeping track of multiple things at the same time, keeping track of the array, keeping track of the variable pause, keeping track of the uh, while loops and if else's and nested if else's. So if that was a little bit too difficult, don't worry too much. Um, but you want to get there, that is your goal to get up to that level for the practice because this question, as you see, did come straight from the ETS sample guide. But, but at the same time, I mean, you can always prioritize when you're taking the practice. So you can leave these hardest questions to last, answer all the questions you know or are pretty confident on first before you have to do the uh, more complicated ones like this. Um, so e e even if this is a little bit out of your range, you still might be able to do well on the practice. So mm -hmm. hopefully you're able to follow along in that example. And hopefully your groups were able to get that same answer. When you didn't get that answer. Yeah. And what I wanted to say to add into this is this question is specifically there for you to see what you're supposed to do, the steps you're supposed to know, how to step through, how to know what is the output that is coming. The only thing that was missing here is them leaving something out for you to fill out. But otherwise, it completely stepped on everything they say you, you're supposed to know in this section. All right, let's go next, Nick. Okay, so uh, we're about ready to take our break, but we did want to just give you some resources because this is, uh, as we know, one of the hardest topics, the time complexity as, and, um, and also these different searches and sorts. Um, so we did include links to even some of the ones that um, you don't necessarily need for the practice exam. We're going to be talking about recursion in the next section after our break. So merge sort and quick sort, we haven't really talked about now because they both use recursion, but that is how they're able to be a lot faster than C. N log N is faster than N squared. So each of these videos will just take you through how that sort works or how that search works. So we recommend that you study some of them uh, later. Most of them come from Harvard's CS50 course. 